Looks good. So, Adelaide, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Christian Schneider. I'm working for the company Teller as a source architect in several Apache projects like uh, CXR, Grab, Camel, Aris, uh, all projects around integration and modularity. And uh, today I would like to show uh, how to do microservices, how microservices are done today a lot, and uh, how it might be better to do them on most time and to show in a demo how we can do that. So as I mentioned before, if you manage to uh, connect to the Freenode uh, IRC, you can try to participate, whatever you type should be displayed here and also later in the, on the screen when I switch to the demo. But it's already active, so you could see, for example, if I uh, move there, it would say motion detected and it would also replicate to the IRC channel. So let's see if that works later. Let's start with a short introduction to microservice. I guess most of you know about it, but have some idea, common understanding. According to Martin Fowler, microservices are a way of designing software applications as independently deployable services. The idea is to organize around the business capabilities, to have automated deployment, which is really necessary in this case, uh, to have dumb pipes and intelligent endpoints, <coughs> and to also to, to be able to use uh, different languages and store the data differently between microservices. So it's all very coupled, um, but as we see later, maybe there is a cost. Um, so we create the application out of independent global services. We use verticals around the business capabilities, so we don't uh, split microservices through the horizontal layering, but rather through verticals. So each should be a complete little thing you have. Uh, Decentralized data, because if I connect everything to the same database that is interconnected with its tables, then it's connected at that point already, so it can't be independent. Uh, if you have many different microservices, then automated deployment is a must, because you would get crazier uh, else. And a typical thing in microservices is that there is one service per process, which is quite a big limitation if you have that. Uh, and typically, you use lightweight communications like REST, which is not that lightweight, but we call it lightweight, or some messaging uh, communications. Um, the most common way, I guess, to implement microservices today is using Spring Boot. It's a framework uh, based on the Spring uh, framework. It uses some annotations, some, some these starter uh, dependencies that you can easily add to your uh, POM, uh, if you use MAME, to really start easily with an application, you have some few dependencies on top level, you have some easy to copy paste classes to start with, and are ready to, to go. It's also a convention of configuration, so uh, you don't have to configure a lot of things up front. It has some good defaults, you can start, and it has some good way to, to get, get you going. And last thing, it's quite ready for the cloud and uh, for Docker, so it has the, the capabilities to be installable on, uh, on these environments you need for the, uh, for the microservices that are fully automated. But it's not all bright. There's also a dark side of microservices. This slide is also pretty quite dark. <laughs> uh, so let's see, <clears throat> what would Yoda say? Are microservices really stronger than those GI? No, no, no. Quicker, easy, more effective. So I, I think this is something that really describes Spring Boot. It's so easy to start with that you get lured into doing it this way. And you might end up in, in solutions that are less than perfect. For example, this is something I found on Twitter about the anatomy of the death spiral. It's the interconnections between microservices. So in theory, they said when microservices were studying that each microservice is standalone, it's not using other microservices. But that's rather like it is uh, done in practice. Microservices use other microservices. And as they are all independently 
developed maybe by different teams, they might not even know all of these interdependencies. So if you do microservices, you should keep a good eye on these interconnections because you might even end up with cycles in the end and uh, it can create a, at the very least a complex system and maybe even a very brittle system. And another thing is operations. Back in the time of application servers, it was a bit like this. You had your applications out of uh, modules all deployed into an application server. A big, vehicle, easy to steer, maybe not easy, but at least you only had to steer one thing. So it was, for operations, it was quite, quite nice to, to do. Now we have microservices. So in theory, it should look like that. A fully automated container terminal uh, where you have these trains and automated vehicles that drive your uh, containers. Basically, imagine that as a, as a Docker container, uh, that as the deployment, all automated, all nicely working together, nicely bringing everything there where it should be, losing nothing. And in practice, we are rather at that point. This is how they uh, work with, or worked with containers on some remote islands. Uh, they didn't have the harbor facilities or like we would have the operation automation. So it was uh, they using the boats they had. <laughs> They're putting their containers in and tying it all together and towing it around and it worked in some way. So, most of the containers reached their destination, but it was not a system you would want to manage, at least not in a highly uh, effective company that you want to be. Another thing is, uh, if you have a bad design and you monolith and you're splitting it up, it will not be better. So if your monolith is a heap of shit, and you build microservices, you have multiple pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing should be the design. But it's easier to deal with Well, it is, it is small, but they are all interconnected. So in the end, the complexity is at least not, not lower, <laughs> probably higher. <laughs> because uh, out of uh, many dependencies inside a big monolith, you now have many dependencies in distributed systems. I would rather have the monolith. <laughs> if your design is good, it's not so bad. But, uh, what design of legacy application is good? The other thing is how small, how lightweight is Spring Boot. They always say it's a really lightweight way of uh, developing software. It's easy to start, but it's not lightweight. <laughs> so if you start with Spring Boot and pull some starters in, maybe have some few other dependencies, you easily, in a really small project, end up with 19 dependencies, and at least a 20 of these jar file, most times more. And the bad thing is it all pollutes your class path, the class path of each developer. So if you have 19 dependencies, almost everything you can find uh, on your class path, the developers can use any of these implementation classes in their code. I think they should, maybe not, <laughs> but they have it all on the fingertips and you know what people do, they see some nice class and they use it. So it's, it's difficult to establish a set of APIs to use for the developers if it all is open and all is uh, at their fingertips and so easy to use. So how is OSGI different? One thing I personally think is, is really important in doing any of is to code against APIs and specs. So the way to decouple the modules of your application is to only make them dependent on some few APIs that are also hopefully well designed, change suddenly. So the APIs are the core of all your, all your application. They bind all together. So you should have good APIs. And ideally, if you want to have long-term stability, you should rely on specs, which are a lot more stable than 
for example, all the newest JavaScript frameworks that change three times during the year. And, uh, people say, the framework from the app, the hype from last year is so old this year. And the other thing is uh, bundles. OSGI bundles are basically jars with some metadata that describes what the bundle provides and what it requires. So what packages it provides, what services it provides, services required, packages required, also other requirements like I need a database or I need a, a, a certain dependency injection framework. A bundle can describe all of that and it's also at the moment or at the present highly automated so you don't have to uh, write these descriptions yourself, they just <coughs> come out of the box. And the big difference to jars is that they are self-describing. So a jar doesn't tell you what it needs, what it provides, it just is there, you put it together with other jars in class path, and you know if it's working when you call the classes, not at uh, packaging, not at deployment time, only when you really call classes. So it fails very late. But OSGI can really do that early. You know if it should work. Then another really big part in OSGI is OSGI services. Um, basically, imagine it as a, like the only real solution to the factory problem. You have an API, and you need, you want to use it, but you should not know the implementation. In most other ways, you somehow call a factory or a service finder or something like that, and in the end, your calling code needs access to the implementation because at the start it needs to pull it up in some way. In OSGI, the services are instantiated by each bundle on our own, the implementations are private, and you really only need the API. And that's the biggest differentiator, I think, between OSGI and uh, non-OSGI applications. Uh, another thing is semantic versioning. It's something we all know. We have this uh, I'll describe it in more detail later in the next uh, slide. Basically, it's a way to dis uh, decide if something is compatible or not. And uh, remote, uh, OCI services by standard are just local things. You can call a service on the same machine. Of course, if you want to do microservices, that's not enough. You want to do remote calls, you might want to do REST. And remote service admin is the OCI spec that can solve this problem. Basically, it allows to publish and consume services over um, boundaries of, of machines and processes. So it's the more important part of the solution. And the last thing is flexible packaging. That means in it's pretty good. The packaging is always what you have in your starters would de also define your runtime. In OSGI you would code against the specs in the bundles and only at a later point decoupled define your packaging. We will see how we can dynamically um, choose our, our packaging like we need it at that point without changing the code. Semantic versioning. This is something we all kind of know about. We have major versions, minor versions, bucket version, and they should mean something. So you should not do a major version just because marketing tells you that they have some cool new features and it is a major version. No, there should be rules. Major version means you have incompatible API changes. So basically, it doesn't even mean or have to mean you have new functionality. Major version is technically most necessary to, to cut down deprecated stuff because then it gets really incompatible. Then minor versions and just functionality are bug fix compatible, and bug fix versions should not add anything, they just fix some small thing. They should be really compatible. And in OSGI, there is automation to um, <coughs> make sure that this semantic versioning is respected. So it tells you if you do a change that is incompatible and it fails your build and can fix by adjusting the version and so you know that you're doing something wrong or something special. While if you don't have the automation, you might easily make a change that is incompatible. And also be careful about API, SPI. API means you call something, SPI means you implement something. The rules for semantic versioning are completely uh, turned around in this case. So it's important to know if an interface is an API or an SPI interface. And also that is automated. Some short overview about remote service admin. Basically, it's, it's too small to really read, uh, read 
uh, you have your application bundle that offers services, that consumes services, and basically remote service admin uh, takes care of uh, exposing uh, your OSGI service if you want as a publicly available endpoint, for example, a REST endpoint, or consume it uh, via a proxy, so you, you see in your own environment an OSGI service locally. If you call it, it goes to the outside as a remote call, for example, a REST call. But it's very flexible. Uh, the spec doesn't tell you which implementation or which transports you can do. So there are many different implementations for transports. Uh, like uh, SOAP, uh, REST, JMS, uh, uh, TCP serialization, some binary bindings. So it's really customized. And also these um, little component, the Polity Manager. This is where you can put all your um, where you can put all your uh, policies. So if you have company policies about security, about which services should uh, see which others, the Polity Manager can decide which things from the outside should be visible, which should be posted to the outside, which security rules to uh, obey, and uh, basically it tells the remote service admin component how to create the endpoint or how to create the proxies. And the, the last point, the discovery is to uh, publish and consume the uh, found endpoints to the outside world. And uh, for example, we use uh, Zookeeper for discovery in most cases. Uh, for REST with RSA, basically, uh, it's just what I explained. You can uh, have an OSGI service and expose it as a REST service. You just annotate it with Jaxa REST annotations or standard. Then you make it, you mark it for transport. So it's a normal OSGI service with a certain property on it. And then it's detected and exported as a REST endpoint. So basically, you can use an OSGI service to do the typical REST communications you want for microservices. So let's see it in practice. I <coughs> prepared a small chat application uh, with one central uh, API, a chat listener interface that can receive chat uh, messages and forward them to all, um, all listening services, all chat services. And we use uh, remote service admin in one part to do that uh, over process boundaries and potentially over machine boundaries. Um, what I'm showing is several ways to implement that chat service. I've got an IRC connector that connects to an uh, IRC server on the cloud. Everything coming in from IRC is sent to all the other services. Everything uh, going on in the in our OSGI world, we go out to the uh, connector, get the shell integration using GoGo. So this means a coma to send chat messages. Um, we also see on the shell when chat messages arrive. Uh, I've got this Tinkerforge display uh, where you will see each, uh, this page chat message uh, coming in. So I just see that uh, an IRC user, Morgan Hartman, uh, has uh, entered the IRC channel. Uh, I, I told you before to, to help with <laughs> your presentation. And um, yeah, also I have a small motion detector. If I go there and I see motion detected, then it's also reflected on the IRC channel and on, on the shell. So let's see how that can be deployed. So we have all these modules, the API, the shell integration, the purchase display, IRC connector. And the first deployment is just put all together in one process, no microservices, all, only local OCI services. And that's a really simple thing to manage, one process. All together, all dependencies, six can be. You would not be able to run the bare Spring Boot to that. And I include Camel and Dickerford and uh, the OCI framework, Zookeeper. It's all six and B, not more. There are no remote calls, no distributed computing that can fail, besides, of course, the IRC, all these certain things, but inside your application, at least, just fail. <coughs> and still, it's, it's really modular, because all the modules are just coupled through the API and through OSGI service, so let's really use the app. So it's like, basically, it's like our container vessel. It's still easy to manage for, for operations. Um, so let's first see that. Add a little bit into the code. So let's first look at 
the chat listener interface, it's just a simple on message. One of the most simple uh, interfaces. Uh, chat message is just some properties, time, sender, message, um, what you want to see in an IRC message. And then a chat broker, that's already a declarative services component using some, some annotations. Um, so this chat broker is how the other components send messages out. Basically, it's just uh, referencing some other OSGI service using uh, OSGI services using this uh, annotation. So it finds all the services, the local as well as the remote ones of this type. And uh, basically, just when a message comes in, it sends it out uh, using the parallel stream to each of the listeners. Or this, this is just a little bit of plain Java encoder. So this is part of the annotations plain Java. And for OSGI, the only settings we really need to do um, is export package because by standard, we also have everything is private. We just export this one package with our API. This is, by the way, the only public thing in all the demonstration. All other packages are private and cannot be seen by the other branches, which ensures your modularity, ensures your uh, decoupling. And from the phone side, it's also pretty simple. There's a parent pop, but it does not define that much. Just for the most part, you do the make, uh, to call the plugin to create the bundle, to enhance the job with the OGI information. But it does not need any special configuration to use this for Then we have the uh, Google Felix shell command. Um, also, it's in the same way, it offers a service. It has some properties that tells the Google shell which is the group and the comment name. Uh, it references our chat broker to send out stuff. And uh, when uh, you type send and, and uh, some, some message, it comes on this channel, uh, this method, and it just sends out to the broker. And the broker takes care to uh, go to all uh, listeners. In the same way, we can listen. We just uh, say we are a chat listener. We export that as an OSGI service using that annotation. And this is the magic property for, for remote service admin to say uh, this chat listener may be uh, remotely visible, so it may be distributed. Then we have sorry, we have the IRC component which uses uh, Camel. So uh, there we have some some uh, uh, some definition to say we are configurable and have we can accept it with that name and there is also a type safe configuration we can define which uh, attributes we, we want uh, how the defaults are and when it's activated this component is always activated when all mandatory references are there so we say we need the camel IRC component camel D component and when these are there uh, the uh, camel context is starting up and we're using an IRC uh, endpoint from camel and just say from this IRC uh, chat channel, if something comes in, we convert it to our internal API using a plain old Java class and uh, we call as a bean this injected uh, OSGI service up there, um, which sends out to all other channels. And we also create a camel producer here, which uh, is used uh, when a message <coughs> is in on the, the other side, uh, from the inside of our system, and we send out using the produce, camel producer on the IRC UI, so this is going to the IRC channel. So that's the IRC part. And the Tinkerforge part is also not very much uh, more complicated. This one is defining the Tinkerforge connection. <laughs> we are also configurable again um, with the ports. Uh, we connect to the uh, Tinkerforge daemon. Um, this is just for a connection. And on the LCD side, uh, we define uh, that we have an LCD display. Uh, we have a listener for the buttons to, to switch which message to show. Um, when a message comes in, it goes through a chat buffer that I will not explain because it's uh, too much now. And uh, on the LCD display, we just show the message, so it's also not really big, difficult to code. And the motion detector is, uh, detection is just also uh, a motion detector. We uh, had a, a listener, and when some uh, motion is detected, it sends a message. That's all. That's all the development side. And on the uh, packaging side,
OCI. That's another important thing in OCI. It's traditionally a bit complicated to do uh, packaging in OCI. And this is a, a lot easier now. Um, we define the uh, dependencies as, uh, as maven dependencies, including transcript dependencies. So we tell what we want to deploy. We can also exclude some stuff that is not OCI bundles. And uh, this is just all the, the stuff we need. And it creates, uh, using this um, plugin, uh, an OCI uh, index. So basically, this is not exactly what we want to deploy. It's what we can choose from. And then we are uh, creating our actual packaging using uh, PND tools, which is an Eclipse uh, plugin for OCI. And we say we're having this, uh, this index that was created here. This one is, is uh, fixed to my local repository, because I don't know how to use a placeholder for a local repository here, but it should be easy to replace that. And uh, it's just saying that we want the Felix framework, Java 8, and some properties to start the framework with, like where do we store our configuration and stuff. And apart from that, this is the basic for all packagings, and now for all packaging, which packages all the modules together, just uses this repository and you can choose your bundles and search them and move them to the right side and say these are the requirements. This is not everything I deploy, but the top level things. And now it uses this whole giant repository to find all the rest. Uh, like I described with these self-describing bundles, they tell what it needs, what they need. For example, the IRC chat component will <laughs> tell the system that it needs camel, that it needs camel IRC, and so it's automatically it, when, it, when we use the resolve button, it creates a solution for the deployment. Uh, so these are then all the bundles really that uh, will be uh, deployed. And um, either on, uh, uh, I, can, I can export here, or I can use my main build. My main build will do the same export and result step. So I don't need this uh, UI. Built, it's all in Maven. Uh, we'll produce a jar file that is completely self contained, self running. So you can just run it with Java, and uh, like you see, it's just 6 MB and includes all jars that are selected this one from this whole bunch. And I also already uh, started it here, so the way to start it is just Java, jar, chat all jar. And when it starts up, it connects to IRC, it connects to the Tinkerforge display and shows um, our, uh, for example, now the motion detected. I wait a bit and move there and it says motion detected and we see it joins the, the IRC channel and also says motion detected there. Now I'm trying if I can um, send something to one of the guys in the ISC channel. Oops. Here I show three deployment units. Uh, in the demo, I show two. 
uh, basically you can freely combine the, the bundles you want and say how we uh, see fit for it and Zookeeper will do the uh, service discovery for us and they all can communicate with each other. So basically I will stop this and use the, the other packagings IRC. So this one will uh, connect to the IRC channel. Oops. And uh, this one will connect to the Gigaforge uh, display. And they should be able to uh, see each other. So now I send <coughs> I send one good. It's not good. Send it high. And we should see high on the Gigaforge display because it's local. Uh, but now we should be able to say hello to everyone. So we see it here and we also see it here. So a remote service admin bridges the processes and can also bridge um, machines easily. So this is uh, for um, from the shell directly. And um, I can also start it here in run or debug mode and have it directly in, in, uh, in Eclipse. I can also use uh, breakpoints and debug through my application, so it's quite easy to work with that. So it's coming up and I can shell again. I can also see, ah oh, no, here there are no endpoints. Um, I have an endpoints command in the um, microservice variant where I can see the, my own endpoints, uh, remote endpoints and see that the remote service admin is, is seeing my modules that should work together over the system boundaries. I can also do that um, using Docker. So I'm <coughs> creating Docker um, images for the components. I use Docker Compose up and uh, it starts the IRC uh, deployment and the display deployment and they are all now running inside Docker on my machine um, also on a third uh, component as a zookeeper as a separate thing and this of course is then really near to the cloud you can use these Docker images to go to the cloud and uh, it should work quite in the same way in the cloud we also see it's, uh, it's joining from IRC. It should also really be reflected here. It's reflected two times because both components report back uh, through the shell integration the IRC. <coughs> so you see, we uh, can use exactly the same code. To use um, to, to deploy either as one, we will call it a monolith, but I think it's not really a monolith if it's uh, like that. <clears throat> it's a modular application, but it's just deployed as one process. You should try to do that as long as you can, but if you cannot anymore, if, you are, if one of your modules changes very often, the rest is really stable, or if one needs to scale a lot and the others not, then you can decide what to take out and what to deploy as an independent, uh, independent uh, service and uh, use microservices basically as you need but not, you're not forced to. So we have the same bunch as before. We can create any, as many deployment units as needed and we can scale each deployment unit and <coughs> the cluster assembly. Uh, we have these runnable jobs that are easy to start and use the Docker containers for the same thing, you can go to the cloud and this uh, remote service uh, uh, admin overhead from Iris is just about one MP for the simplest component, the TCP uh, transport. Uh, we will use local calls or remote calls as needed, so when an, a service is locally available, we'll not do a remote call, so we can local as far as possible and we can go, can go remote where we need it. We have a lot of uh, protocols 
But of course, as soon as you go microservices, uh, you can have the same operation pro problems. I mean, it does a bit service discovery, but you have so many problems in distributed computing that uh, it can easily end up like this still. So be careful uh, going microservices. You can see OCI can scale very small to very large, but it doesn't solve all the operational problems of microservices. So basically, if you're unsure you really need microservices, and you should be, then start creating a modular application. I would re uh, recommend to use OSGI if there are other possibilities. Stay modular, stay on one process as long as you can for deployment, and then decide. If you see fit for microservice deployment, migrate into that, uh, but only if you see fit. Stay on a simple system that the microservice guy called a monolith. Uh, as long as you can, and only go to microservices as far as you need. So I've got here some, some ideas for further reading. So lots of people I know about a similar theme, um, the example code, and another example that shows how to expose the rest of the points. And, uh, the, the first example that I showed uses BLT tools for packaging. And the other example shows uh, the same on Karaf, uh, an OSGI server that is really nice to use. So you should look maybe into both. I will post the, the presentation and the links on uh, Twitter and also over the conference channel, so you should be able to find all that. So all my questions? change things at runtime in OSGI. Uh, basically, it even makes it easier to use one process because you could really change at runtime things. You could create a microservice deployment in one process, but I typically would not uh, do that because you can do it, but it increases the, the kinds of problems you can have. So I think it's easier, you can go that way, but I think it's easier to just create a kind of static deployment still having a lot of the advantages of OSGI, with the decoupling services that talk to each other and remoting automatically. Uh, but keeping your packaging static is an easier way of deployment because if you change things in a running system all the time, then you're not sure if you restart the system if you have the same state again. And the operations guys will also be a bit skeptic about uh, changing things in a running system all the time. So. I would rather go for static packaging and maybe even do all the microservice uh, practices uh, as they, they have it with Docker and uh, cloud environments where, where, where they <coughs> fit for it um, because this is something that will have a lot of drive behind it and uh, it will be at some point a, a hopefully a stable platform and uh, using the full dynamic dynamics of OSGI and redeployment can be interesting for, especially for embedded devices, um, where you can just uh, redeploy the device <laughs> all the time. Uh, you might have to update it on site, uh, but if you don't have the reason for the on site uh, updates or in process updates, I would rather be careful with that. So, two more? Maybe a, a question how many people have used OSGI? <laughs> percentage. So maybe it's a, a, an idea to, to look into it. The good thing is OSGI is a lot easier than it was. So we had a lot of uh, problems with uh, libraries at the start. Now most of the libraries at, uh, at Maven Central are, or well, many of the important ones are OSGI bundles already. You can just take them from there. And, uh, with the annotations, uh, it's easy, so you don't have these OGI APIs that you have to code against. So I think it's it's quite easy now. So it's easy to start. With. It's, uh, especially with the examples here, they are really easy to follow. <coughs> Give it a try. Uh, 